Hi, so I'm Alma from the Green Times and Paul, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Paul Rouds. I'm the CEO of Toco. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Paul, for, for talking to us today. I thought it would be very interesting to, to get properly to grips to about what Toco does and why it would be beneficial for us and for the planet for us to start using Toco as a, as a currency. Why did you go, why did you do this? What was your, your motivation behind all of this? Mm. Thanks, Emma. The motivation behind this is, is, is quite simple. Um, when thinking about the future and generally at important life stages like the birth of my daughter in my case, um, when looking at my young baby daughter for the first time, I realized the tremendous sense of responsibility. Um, and looking, looking back at that moment, what I realized is that um, I'm not proud of the world that she's inheriting as a, as a member of the human race. Um, and I needed to, from a purpose perspective, I needed to change something and I needed to try something. And then when, start, when I started delving deeper into the world of climate and climate tech and climate change, I realized that the further I looked into this space um, as an entrepreneur, the further I realized that we're not in a great place. Um, and just to illustrate that, we wear this graph on our, on our shirts at Toko to remind the world of the history of carbon dioxide um, concentration in the atmosphere. You know, this is, this is the line that tracked carbon dioxide concentrations and then the industrial revolution hit and humans started burning fossil fuels incredibly efficiently. And it became, it became this wonder, this, and, and, and I do mean that, it's a, it is a wonderful time to be a human being at the moment. Um, if you look at our history in context of the thousands of years that humans have, you know, since we walked out of the cave for the first time, humans are flourishing. Um, but there is something that we need to address. Um, and we fixed, you know, capitalism has fixed a lot of problems, solved a lot of issues. We are flourishing. But there is this existential crisis that we need to address. We need to we need to a keep talking about it but b do something about it um, absolutely now other... we're flourishing at the expense of the future so at the expense of our children yes i i i do agree with you there um and and i think to a certain extent we could agree that we are flourishing at the expense of nature at the expense of the natural environment we absolutely. we grow our economies grow um, and nature makes way for that growth. A forest is not seen as an, as, a, as an asset in our current definition of what an asset is. And that we believe that is one of the biggest challenges to, to, to nature and to preserving and growing the natural world is it doesn't fit on a balance sheet. And it's always going to be um, a challenge of economic growth and you know you look at you read headlines and you look at the amazon rainforest being cleared and you, you hear the facts about how many football fields of rainforest is being cleared and you think to yourself how can that be how can that be happening don't the people know how important that is but Alma, if you distill the world into two countries saudi arabia and brazil and you look at what's happened if you just take everything else away and you look at what happened um, in the world. We've given all the money to Saudi Arabia because of the demand for oil and this insatiable demand, which whether it's right or wrong is irrelevant. It's just the fact that there's so much demand on the, on the resource that they produce, that yeah. is produced out of the country. So we gave them all the money. But then Brazil have arguably a greater natural resource, but there's no demand there's no demand for forests to be grown, to be preserved. And if there was demand, our question is, if there was demand, would that change the way that people think about a natural asset, environmental wealth? 
if there was a demand for that pristine, incredible um, resource. So, and that's and that's really the the crux of what we're talking about in Toko is incentive. Is is what what is it, you know ultimately humans. I don't, I don't I mean, I'll be generalizing massively here, but this is the way I feel. Humans, humans are all about what's in it for me and growing their value. And, and let's be honest, the, the money is very important in all of this. Um, well, you see, that's the capitalist model that we, were, uh, that we thrive in, unfortunately. It's all about what can I get? And that's why, you know, us crazy greenies were off the wall three decades ago. Not anymore, <laughs> because yeah. of course we were the pioneers, because you can think bigger than yourself. You're not the only one on the planet, you know. <laughs> and as a parent, that's, that's how one starts thinking. I, I also, in 1990, had two, two little boys, and I thought, my goodness, how mm. can this be? I, I'm creating, you know, feeding them as well as I can and make sure that everything is good around them. But, but, uh, but there's no future for them like this which is what your mm. motivation was exactly the same. So altruism is, is not something that we are that great at. Although I think it's growing mm. quite a lot. I mean, we've developed a lot more awareness over the last three decades, but people still mm. want to see what, how is it going to benefit me, unfortunately. Mm. Mm. I heard a, um, a pretty amazing story about um, Easter Island and I, and yeah, I hope it's true, but I did a little bit of research on it. But um, essentially, the the summarized version of this is that um, you know, Easter Island have 130 odd stone statues facing out to protect the island against the spirits from from the sea. Um, mm -hmm. And when they analyzed the rock that you know these big beautiful stone statues were created from, it was from the middle of the island. And um, so they thought, you know, how did the civilization which were obviously very advanced how did they move those stone statues from the center of the island out to the to the perimeter um and then they started looking deeper and they realized that that there was these big great forests on the island um, and the civilization at the time that is that that famously has not flourished um how how did they move the stone statues and the theory goes that they cut down all the trees to move these stone statues from the middle of the island out to the perimeter and at some stage, somebody probably said, you know, when the last tree was being cut down, hey, God, maybe this isn't the greatest plan because we, we depend on the trees for our, and somebody said, no, 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 don't be silly. This is the, this is the way it should be done. Um, and in the pursuit of idols and the pursuit of materialistic things, um, all that I'm saying is we should learn from the lessons of the past where the new idol is you know, perhaps material things, material goods that we're chasing. Um, and I don't want to get too philosoph philosophical here, but the, the true value, the true valuable things in our lives um, sometimes are not the material goods and not the idols that we chase. Um, and I guess, I guess the question is, um, and this kind of speaks to, speaks to the direction that Toko is is trying to take and the, and the purpose that we're trying to follow is ultimately how do we create existential change? How, how, how do you do that? How do you create value in underlying assets? How do you create a va value in removal of CO2 from the atmosphere? How does that become a valuable activity? Um, and, and we don't have time to change from capitalism to another political ism. Um, because as you quite rightly know, 2030 is around the corner. And by 2030, we need to be removing 25 to 30 billion tons of CO2 from the atmosphere. We're not going to change geopolitical structures and constructs. So the question is, how do we create change, big change as quick as possible? We, we probably fit into capitalism, but we offer a new alternative. We try and evolve the thinking into placing value on the underlying asset um, and the underlying asset in this case being the natural world. Um, and that with that kind of thinking and that kind of constructs, um, we, we designed the, the TOCO ecosystem, how, how we see that developing. Um, and 
And the thing about, you know, when I talk about geopolitical forces and capitalism and all these kind of things, that's, that's at a very big, high level. Yeah. We don't, I'm a simple dude. Like, I'm a, I'm a simple guy. Like, I can't, I don't want to talk at high, that high level um, because I don't understand it. I don't, I don't understand what goes on in the, in the hall at, at COP, at the COP27, you know, all the COPs before that. I probably would be out of my depth completely. Um, but the one thing I do know is that the time for talking is, is, is probably over and the time for action is now. Um, and, and I'm sure that I'm not alone in those feelings. You know, I, I see this thing like COP and you think, okay, that's surely that's the way that we're going to find a solution. Um, there's been 27 years of that. And are we going to find a solution in the 52nd year? Uh, you know, when, when, when are emissions start, are going to start decreasing? And let's be honest, the last two times in the past 20 years where emissions have decreased have been 2008 and during COVID. So, so you, you know, emissions are inherently built in to the economic growth model. We cannot, you know, our economies grow and our emissions are up and to the right. Um, and until we, until we evolve our thinking and evolve and challenge the status quo, um, certainly my feeling is that nothing, nothing is going to change. Absolutely. And I feel everything we, that we do now needs to be focused on basically disrupting things. Mm. I mean, you are really yeah. in the space of disrupting finance in a sense, because it's a few seconds to midnight for this planet. Mm. So there, there mm. just isn't time. I mean, if we started in the 1970s when we already knew about climate change and we already knew we were in trouble, we could have done a lot of gradual things, but we need big big actions now. So mm. would you walk us through now? Toka is, a, an, is an alternative digital currency. So what happens if I, for example, trade? Do I trade my brands for, for tokens? Is that how it works? Mm. So think about, think about Toko in the same way as you think about dollar, pound, or euro. Um, mm. The reason why we chose the name Toko, pan, of carbon offset, T and OCO being the molecular structure of carbon dioxide, and being the measurement. And if you think about currency, uh, pound is a pound sterling. It was the it was yes. the, the measurement of a weight of a precious metal oh, that wow. represented value. Um, and if, and if you think about currency, currency is always something that represents the value. Paper notes is an IOU for a element of value that exists in a bank or somewhere. Yeah. Um, so it's very intentional, the choice of carbon offset, because it's the measurement of the value that represents the currency. So think about, think, when you think about um, TOCO, just think about it as, as a different currency. So if you could, if we offered you the ability to spend dollars in Stellenbosch or pounds in Stellenbosch, it's the same kind of, it, it's exactly the same. Um, TOCO, each TOCO in circulation um, has been created as a result of a ton of carbon being removed from the atmosphere. And we can talk about that next because I know that there's a lot of questions um, surrounding that. Um, so we buy a certificate, um, a carbon credit that, is, that proves that a ton of carbon has been removed by a project um, elsewhere in the world, and we can talk about that in a second. But essentially that certificate of value is then held at um, a foundation in Geneva called the Carbon Reserve. Um, and that is like the gold in the, um, in the vault that allows one to create money supply. It is the asset that backs yeah. the value of the currency, if that makes sense. Um, so that yeah. carbon credit that is produced by um, and if we switch our attention a little bit to the, to the carbon credits side of things, um, if you think about um, ways in which carbon is removed from the atmosphere, carbon dioxide is removed from the atmosphere, there's about 170 different ways in which we can remove CO2 from the atmosphere. There's um, agricultural, um, there's natural, um, there's you know, soil carbon storage or sequestration yeah. as it's called. Um, 
there's ge geological, there's technological, there's ocean-based uh, reduction. Um, so there's 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 no shortage of ways in which we can remove CO2. And the most successful, as we probably all know, the most successful of those are um, are natural. Um, nature is often the, the best innovator. Um, and and <clears throat> so there's there's a lot of ways in which we can remove um, those projects then get registered and third party verifiers come in and, and verify that um, the amount of tonnage that is being absorbed and removed from the atmosphere is correct. Um, and they go through a whole series of tests and rigmarole and process. Those are then listed on registries. Um, so we buy from a couple of different registries that are, um, that are known as the world's kind of the world's best, um, Vera, Gold Standard, et cetera, et cetera. Um, publicly available information on those registries um, are available on all the assets that we purchase, all the carbon credits that we purchase and hold at the carbon reserve. The carbon reserve then buys those assets, puts together a portfolio of carbon credits, um, and then creates the, the money supply as a result of that. So that's how the system works. Um, and if I can... If, let me pause there for some, some follow-up questions. Yeah, so now if we come down to, to on the ground practical stuff, I mean, I see that you spoke about the VERA registry mm -hmm. that I went and read up a little bit about, and particularly you supporting two projects, which is the Makira project and the Grootbos mm -hmm. project. Is that correct? Those are the mm -hmm. only two that you currently work with? That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. So the Makira project is a um, it's a reduced deforestation project in Madagascar. Um, it's one of the oldest rainforests in Madagascar, and the and it's one of the more successful projects um, in Southern Africa. Um, and essentially, what the project does is, um, as a result of the of the forest growing and expanding, the reduced deforestation of it, the expansion of this natural rainforest it is removing CO2 from the atmosphere as a result of that. Um, so when, and the Grootbos, so that's listed on the Vera registry, the Grootbos um, uh, carbon credit purchase was, um, we, we chose that specifically because we wanted to give people in Stellenbosch in South Africa a relevant, um, applicable uh, example, because the Makira forest, you know, people, have no context to it it's a wonderful project it's a bit far away people yes. have, it's a bit far away yeah so people have a lot of context on on Kripos, which is a wonderful uh famous nature reserve that that expands um the nature reserve by buying farmland and sequestering carbon in, yes. the, in the soil or removing uh, I know Kripos carbon from well i've stayed there lovely place um yeah, so is that very, only very, is Kripos the only one in south africa currently that sells um carbon credits no, no, and uh, and Kripo sell um, their credits on a registry called Credible Carbon, um, okay. and that has kind of it's not as um, it's it's known as kind of South Africa's best registry. Um, it's certainly not the only one, um, but one of one of the stated intentions of the Carbon Reserve is to expand um, expand the voluntary carbon market and expand these carbon markets so that there are much much more. Uh, people coming to the market to sell their their goods, and in this case, their goods are tons of carbon removed from the atmosphere. Um, now, we all know that the way to expand a market, any market, um, is to increase demand. So, if you have bigger crowds at a fruit market, you're going to have more farmers, and and if yeah. all the farmers are selling out of all their fruit all the time, then the price of that fruit is going to go up, um, and if if, if the market grows because more people come there, then it's going to get bigger and expand and going to get more successful. Um, and and what, who benefits at the end of the day is the producer of the good, of the thing that is in great demand. Um, and in this case, we believe that the carbon credit market is the way in which we are going to drive that demand signal, that the the... the the, the, the demand will expand the market such that and increase the price, hopefully, in that market, such that farmers and innovators and companies will see this as an opportunity. And what is the opportunity? 
grow forests, rewild your land. If you're a farmer, you can adopt you know, regenerative agricultural practices, move away from tilling and fertilizer and yeah. um, so you know, does monoculture. That mean that basically, any organic farmer can for example, register for carbon credits? Sure. Well, I, I mean, it depends on the, on the case of each, each of the farmer, but essentially, um, if, if you are a farmer or a landowner and you're managing your land in a certain way, um, we want to create more incentive to change the way that you farm because there is a lucrative outcome by, after that change. It's not just, you know, it's the way people think about it, it's the right thing to do. And why is it the right thing to do? Because if you change these farming practices, you are storing more carbon in the soil because the organic matter in the soil has a chance to expand, has a chance to grow. Yes, um, but that is, that's what um, organic farming has done forever. So, I mean, those people actually should all qualify for carbon credits, not so? 100%, 100%. Yeah. Okay. And and the, the incentive the incentive to the, the previously the incentive to adopt organic farming practices and regenerative agriculture is that you can charge a premium for organic produce. That's kind of the the incentive that, that to shift. Is not, um, <laughs> that's not a very correct statement. <laughs> organic farmers have a very good and very often very altruistic reasons for doing all the years. The right thing. So no, it's 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 more than that. More than that. I yeah, I, I agreed. Agreed. But uh, but what I'm saying is that ultimately farming is a business. So mm -hmm. there are That's some the there are some business there are some farmers who say I'm going to do the right thing just because it's the right thing to do and I'll make it work. But that's not that's not the mainstream of farmers. And what we are trying to do is we're trying to make it good business to do the right thing. Take care no, of your I, business I, I get you. and take I, care of the planet. Yeah. Organic farmers have never been mainstream farmers. So I'm just talking about the past and all the people who over the years have done the right things. But yeah, you yeah. want to incentivize more farmers to do the right thing by making it more lucrative for them as well. And really what it's doing is it's supporting people who are doing the right things, who are planting trees and looking after the environment. Which exactly. is really, really a, a wonderful idea for those of us who've been doing the right things for a long time. It makes a lot Correct. of sense. It makes a lot of sense. So just help me understand if this is a, a currency, it's not a currency with which I ultimately, what would I be able to buy for it or is it just a once off I'm giving you rands and and now I'm basically offsetting carbon by doing that mm. so um the just to understand how demand is created so mm -hmm. when you decide to switch from spending in rand to spending in toko what you're essentially doing is you are you are you are changing value for value so rand is yeah. is essentially expanding government debt when you spend in rand you you get rand you spend in rand that's the service that currency provides the thing that gives rand its value and and other currencies other money its value is government debt nowadays um, so when you make that choice to change value for value the thing that gives toko its value is co2 removals so if you decide to spend oh, in wonderful. cocoa, you're essentially um, creating demand for more CO2 removals to happen. Yes. Um, and by, by expanding the, every time you do that change, every time you spend in, in Toko, and every time you demand that, the RANDs are going through to buy more CO2 removals, and the Tokos are then being exchanged for value at a shop. Um, but, now, but in Stellenbosch... Yeah. yeah, that's what yeah. I want to know. Yeah, Are there so, shops where I can now uh, shop with tokens? Of course, of course, of course, of course. If you come to, so we decided to focus on Stellenbosch because we want to get the, the community, um, kind of the users and the merchants kind of together and want to create 
a hotspot as a case study for the rest of the world to show them that there is another way. Um, so there's at the moment we we just about a, five weeks into launch, um, but there's 60 different uh, establishments that you can you can come and have. I mean everything from you can look on our website, but then there's a list of all the places where you can spend. But you can um, you can literally do pretty much anything um, with Toko. Um, you can get your haircuts. You can come for breakfast, coffee, lunch, you can go for after work beers and wine and burgers and there's places in the Neil Sea, there's lots of places in the, in the Onodorp here. Yeah. So the idea is that um, people can people can live their lives. Um, and they can and and and, and let me use uh, some numbers um, just to illustrate the impact that, that one can make. So uh, the average South African, and I know that that's a broad term, but the average South African, um, if we do adopt an average, is um, their emissions per year is between seven and 10 tons on average. Okay, mm -hmm. now that can range, you know, there's some South Africans who have 100 and there's some South Africans who have much less, but let's just take That's a couple of planets worth. Is that again? That's a couple of planets worth. Yeah, yeah, so, so 10 tons. Yeah, so so yeah, that's a couple of plants worth, exactly. So 10 tons of CO2, let, let's take that. On a year, um, in terms of the TOCO exchange rate, how much a ton of carbon costs, that's 180 rand per ton. So that's 1,800 rand worth of TOCO, 10 TOCOs. So yeah. if, if, you, if you come into Stellenbosch and you spend 1,800 rand in one month, which is... Not impossible um, if you think about lunch and coffee and after work drinks and et cetera, et cetera. In a month, in, as you would have spent in Rand, but now you're just spending 1,800 Rand's worth of toka, you're spending 10 toka. And you're essentially, by doing that, you've created demand for a full year's worth of emission in a month. So, what I, what I, I come back to what I said earlier about. We need a large existential solution that every single person in their own hands can control and can yeah. adopt. Yeah. Currency just has to, it just happens to be the simplest way to do that. Yeah. Um, and and if you could if you could harness the demand that is created, not on government debt because no one wants to expand more debt. There's $281 trillion of debt that the world is in at the moment. But if you could adopt a currency that expanded demand on CO2 removals, and, and, and it wouldn't cost you anything extra. All you had to do was believe and, and go through an onboarding process that, that, yeah. that we need, and I can explain that in a second, but, but you know, and, and our big question at Toko was, okay, well, if we create this system where you can make climate action easy and free for people, will they adopt it? <laughs> and that's the experiment with which we're busy with now. And we've seen, I must say, we've seen phenomenal response in Stellenbosch uh, and I think, the students. I think and, uh, it's, all, it's about education. I mean, that's why I've been in the education yeah. space for, for so long, because I think any mm. rational human being who understands what's at stake is going to be doing what I'm doing and more. I'm not, exactly. you know, it's just that I'm more informed. That's the only difference between myself and others. Um, which is why I wanted to almost correct you using the word believe. Because there are people that say, oh, I don't, I'm not a believer in climate change, or whatever. I look, it's not a belief mm. at all. It's being up to date mm. on the science. It's actually connecting the dots. It's not religion, mm. you know. It's uh, it's simple science mm. yeah. and understanding it. <laughs> yeah. And and it's not actually you can't disbelieve the the, the facts uh, uh, unless you are, um, yeah, unless you are just looking for staying the way you were. Uh, you know, which some people mm. are, but yeah. So it's a matter of connecting the dots, I think. Mm. And that is where mm. all of us come in. Every person in, in the green space, sustainability space, is doing in their own little way, trying to connect the dots for people and trying to push this, this 
ship to turn around essentially at number 99 before hitting the, the, um, the iceberg. Um, and each person playing in this thing for me is so valuable, which is why I've been looking for this uh, for all these years and, and featuring stories about that because this is what, this is, this, this is the most important news. This is really what motivates people to actually climb on board and see what can I personally do. So may I ask in terms of going forward, um, when are you going to expand beyond Stellenbosch? Because obviously I'm slightly outside and I watch my carbon footprint, so I, I don't willy-nilly drive to Stellenbosch. I think before I before I drive, and sort of and, and Cape Town and so on. What what are the future plans? Mm. Yeah, so we will be expanding into the rest of South Africa from June onwards. Um, mm -hmm. We want to try and use this time in Stellenbosch to get our processes right, uh, make sure um, the system works and we can, we can test it a little bit before mm -hmm. we expand. Yeah. Um, we are already feeling the pull from um, people, communities. Um, but in terms of our expansion, we, we want to empower communities to self-manage, self self-regulate um, and say, if, you know, if you, if you were aware, conscious citizen, you know, highlighting people such as yourself around the world, is these aware, conscious um, people who understand where we are. Um, if you want to make a change, here's the platform to do it, and and you can launch it in your own community yeah. um, whenever you want. Um, so we we'll probably get get to that point because we'll need to have you know the correct support structures and et cetera, et cetera, up and running. Um, but we need you know, to make a significant change, and that is our aim, yeah. um, because, because we are led by the science. We know that um, to hit the 1.5 degree um, increase um, defined by the IPCC, we need to be removing between 25 and 50 billion tons, sorry, 25 and 30 billion tons of CO2 by 2030. An that, enormous amount, which currently is not said to be happening. No, 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 not, not no. at all. Um, and uh, I mean, it's, it's unprecedented for emissions to drop that much in our whole history, in this whole history. <laughs> so I don't know what makes us think that things are going to change without action in the next seven or eight years. So that's why, that's why we are trying to we're trying to act and we're trying to give people a solution that is in their hands, we're trying to give the power back. Yeah. You know, there's this, this feeling of frustration and being overwhelmed and being, you know, if I'm honest, I've, you know, I've been talking to- I go, And go helpless to and to hopeless and all of that. And helpless and hopeless and all of that rolled into one. But I've been talking to a lot of the youngsters, um, you know, going into reses. I was in three reses yesterday, talking to big groups, big audiences of students. Um, and, my feeling and my interpretation is that if people deny climate, that climate change is real, and yeah, we spoke about climate deniers and all that kind of stuff, largely um, because it affects the way they live. They, they are being asked to make changes that, quite frankly, are uncomfortable and that they, that they don't really want to do. Um, so it's mm -hmm. easier to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn away from the science and the obvious facts, and I'm going to, I'm going to, believe what I believe and you can't tell me that that's wrong type thing. Yeah. Um, but, but, and, and to a certain extent, I, you know, you, you have to try and understand from their perspective and, and, you know, all the points of view. Um, but if you are given a solution, that's not going to, not going to affect your lifestyle and you can create um, huge change and enable and empower people to yeah. make the change themselves just by a simple decision that doesn't cost them any more or alter the way that they want to live. Would it's they a do it? no-brainer, really. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we hope a lot of other people see it like that, Alma. Um, <laughs> but what we're seeing is that um, the support has been is, is phenomenal. You know, we, we, we're starting yes. a movement. Um, and yes. we, you know, we want to we want to empower people again and say if you feel powerless if you feel hopeless if you feel overwhelmed join join the toka community Absolutely. because together we can make a big change you know we're yeah. not going to wait for governments we're not going to wait for companies to lead us out of this 
it's time for us to make a difference. And I think generally as, as South Africans, uh, sorry to divert a little bit, but um, you know, I moved with my family to Geneva. We lived there for five years. Then we moved to the UK and then we decided to come back to South Africa because South Africans have a very special culture that sometimes we don't give ourselves enough credit for. And that is resilience. We are incredibly resilient people and we are solutions focused. And when there's a, when there's a big problem and there's a big issue, South Africans get to work fixing Absolutely. and solving. And, yeah. um, you know, having traveled around the world and done business around the world, that quality is, is, is incredibly important. And uh, I think South Africans, we don't often give ourselves enough credit for that. So starting in South Africa um, to try and show the world that there is another way um, is an obvious thing for us is to say, let's, let's, let's start it here. And if, if we can say to the rest of the world, Stellenbosch removed as much CO2 as they emitted in a year, which is 1. 5, roughly 1.5 million tons as a community. And, the, and it was removed as a result of one thing, changing the way that a community transacts. Yeah. Rest, rest of the world, that's, that, there's a solution. And it was demonstrated by this community in Stellenbosch who cares and who believes. It's one of the solutions. I think we're going to need all the solutions that we can get now, which I've uh, right. always been saying, you know, we need all hands on deck. And this is an easy way in which you can put your hands on the deck now without yes. a lot of change to, to your life. I still think one must be still conscious about how much you travel and how much you fly and, and so on. But this is definitely a convenient way and that's the whole thing. Our culture was built on convenience and people mm. don't want to struggle if they don't have to. So it mm. plays into that, that ethics that we've unfortunately grown up with in, 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 our, in our background, in our modern world. But it mm. also means you are not just thinking of yourself. You are you're taking a conscious decision. You can make a a difference with this and maybe that switches on to being more aware of other things as well that would always be the idea mm, exactly exactly I mean, yeah and look the all the i think you're quite right there all the solutions yeah it's we need to embrace every every single solution that's, that's out there you know yes. yeah be conscious think think about Think about the future, think about how our planet is evolving and think about us as caretakers, not, you know, not, not, not the center of the universe, but caretakers of a planet that has existed for millions of years. Absolutely. And think about where the food comes from that you buy, you know, the mm. food miles, the, how it was grown and, and, and the impacts of all of that. So, yeah, it's, I, I think this is, this is hopeful which is rare nowadays in the environmental field. I really love to find hopeful stories. Um, I, we have to be realistic that it's very late. So, you know, it's really, really urgent to do whatever we possibly can. So I'm really excited about this. Thank you for explaining it to us so nicely. I'm awesome. definitely Thanks, going Sam. to join, like no doubt. <laughs> Fantastic. And maybe for the, for the listeners and the readers out there, um, if you do want to join, um, you can go to our website, you can find some more information. Um, we can go to the App Store and download uh, TOCOS, T-O-C-O-S. Um, we do, we will ask you to register with your ID and proof of address um, mm -hmm. because it's a, it's a safe, secure payment network. We also have, um, it's, important, it's important to mention that um, we've partnered with Standard Bank. Um, so mm -hmm. it's, a, it's within the traditional financial secure um, safe place um, and not some you know, digital currency out there in the in the world. So we have an office in Stellenbosch. Uh, we bank with Standard Bank, which is the oldest bank in South Africa. Uh, we work with their compliance teams to make sure that it is a safe, secure place to transact. Um, and that all those things are incredibly important to us. Transparency, authenticity, also incredibly important to us. We understand that in this space that there's sometimes a bit of mistrust with regards to, you know, carbon credits and how that whole system works. So if you want more information, you can look at the carbon reserves website and yeah. um, all the information is on there. Um, 
But, uh, but yeah, Alma, thanks very much for having me. I really appreciate it. And any questions from any of your listeners or anyone out there, our office is in 32 Rainfeld Street, um, if you're in Stellenbosch. But if you're not, send, send us an email um, on our website or, or contact me directly. I'm happy to have a conversation with any interested, passionate people out there. Thanks so much, Paul. Thank you. Thanks, Alma. <laughs>